we have been talking about adsorption and we will continue on the same topic of adsorption. As I introduced in the previous class, adsorption is a surface phenomena. So, you can have a gas getting adsorbed on a surface, a solid surface or even a <coughs> liquid in a solute can get adsorbed on a solid surface. <coughs> so, it is a surface phenomena unlike absorption, where absorption is a bulk phenomena. So, that is the main difference between adsorption and absorption. Absorption is A B, whereas adsorption is A D. So, in absorption, a liquid gets the solute completely dissolved into it or absorbed into it, whereas in adsorption, the solute gets covered on a solid surface. So, there are diff different types of adsorption, one is called the physisorption or physical adsorption, the other is called the chemisorption or chemical adsorption. Both are different especially with respect to the energies involved, especially with respect to the forces that are involved that is the attractive forces between the solute and the surface. In the physisorption, you have very weak forces mostly van der Waal forces of attraction. So, the energy is also very low if you see that the delta H is of the order of 20 to 40 kilo joule per mole and it also takes place at low temperature that means below the boiling point of the adsorbate. Whereas, as the temperature keeps increasing the physics option keeps decreasing. Whereas, on the contrary if you take a chemis option the forces of attractions are chemical forces sometimes uh, it can even form a chemical bond and uh, that is why it is called a chemical adsorption or chemisorption. And um, delta H here is very high almost 200 to 400 kilo joule per mole and it can take place at all temperature. That means, the solute can be in the vapor form also unlike physics option where the solute is below the boiling point. Okay. Here when the temperature increases the chemis option also will increase and then later on it will start uh, decreasing. That means, the solute that got adsorbed on the surface getting desorbed. Generally adsorption is always a thermodynamic equilibrium process. That means, uh, um, you can have adsorption or you can have desorption that is the reverse of the adsorption taking place from the surface of a catalyst or a metal or an inorganic material and so on actually. So, if you look at a typical adsorption isotherm on the x axis you have the pressure and uh, on the uh, y axis you have the amount of uh, adsorbate or the solute that got adsorbed on a surface of the adsorbent of mass m. <coughs> so, generally as the pressure increases the amount that is getting adsorbed per gram or kilogram or pound of the adsorbent will also increase and after some time it gets saturated. That means, further increase in pressure does not increase the amount of uh, material or solute or adsorbate that got adsorbed. So, this is generally an isotherm that is carried out at a constant temperature. So, if you change the temperature you may have a different um, curve, but it will al always follow the same pattern. It will initially increase with pressure after, after that it will get saturated. That is why here we call the saturated pressure region, where you do not see any difference in the amount that is adsorbed even if you increase the pressure further and further. So, at different temperatures you may have curves all exhibiting the same form. There are different types of adsorption isotherms generally we, we use a linear adsorption isotherm or Freudlich or Langmuir and BET is also used uh, if you are talking about multi layer adsorption and all these three adsorption isotherms we generally consider it as generally we consider it as a monomolecular layer. So, the basic um, relationship you have some adsorbate which is in the free form it gets adsorbed on an adsorbent that is an adsorption process. So, you have the adsorbed species now the adsorbed species can desorb. So, you have a vacant site available for some other adsorbate to get adsorbed. Okay. So, you have get a vacant site. So, a vacant active site is necessary for this adsorption process. If 
you look at the reactions like nickel catalyzed hydrogenation, hydrogen has to get adsorbed on the surface of the nickel. If you are talking about some oxidation reactions on platinum catalyst, then the oxygen has to get adsorbed on the surface of the platinum before the reaction takes place and so on. Um, so, the Lee Chatelier's principle says that the direction of equilibrium will always shift so that the stress can be relieved. So, if you are putting in pressure, the direction of the process will go from left to right. And also, if you look at um, the left hand side, you have two molecules and on the right hand side, you have only one molecule. So, always the equilibrium will shift and the number of molecule also decreases, because the adsorbate gets adsorbed on the adsorbent. So, the number of degrees of freedom also decreases. Okay. So, in based on all these principles, you can see that the equilibrium will always shift from left to right. Okay. Now, adsorption is a very important phenomena, it is used in many places, it is used in uh, purifying uh, air, uh, removing toxic uh, gases, it is used in gas mass it is used as a decolorizing agent um, in um, effluents like sugar um, effluent, silica gel which is used for removing moisture that is as a desiccant in a room uh, purification system, alumina gels are also used. Then uh, we use uh, something called uh, zeolites, zeolites are used in uh, uh, removing moisture zeolites are used for many reactions, catalytic reactions. So, adsorption is a very important phenomena in, and we have come across it in many different processes actually. So, what are the factors that govern this particular adsorption? Temperature, pressure, surface area, activation of the adsorbent. So, all these have an effect and we will little bit try to understand the effect of each of these parameters. Temperature, for example, temperature has an effect and uh, the adsorption process. As I talked about before, especially on the chemical adsorption or chemisorption, there, is a, there are temperature effects on the process. Similarly, pressure has an effect on the adsorption process and uh, once uh, the surface gets saturated, after the saturation pressure you will not see. Um, any more adsorption taking place. Surface area, more the surface area, more is the adsorption. So, that is why you have uh, um, activated charcoal, which has several meter square of surface area per gram of the catalyst. So, very small amount of catalyst will have large surface area. So, higher the surface area, higher is the adsorption. Um, so, for adsorption, you will always use high surface area material, whether it is alumina or carbon or zeolite. Um, or silica eliminates and so on. You will never use low surface area material here. Activation of the adsorbent, you have to activate uh, the um, surface, so that adsorption can take place. Sometimes we activate it by uh, uh, passing uh, hydrogen, sometimes we activate it by passing acid, uh, sometimes we activate it by increasing the temperature and so on actually. So, there are different ways by which you activate. So, these are the factors which control the adsorption process. So, most of the industrial adsorbents fall into three categories. One is the oxygen containing compounds and that means, generally they are hydrophilic uh, material, they are polar like silica gels and zeolites. Then you have the carbon based material the, that means, they are hydrophobic or non polar like your activated carbon, graphite and so on. Third type is the polymer based material. The polymers act as a matrix, especially if you look at the ion exchange type of adsorption, um, you have the uh, cations or anions anchored onto a polymer matrix. So, these are the three different types of uh, adsorbent used in the industrial applications. So, let us look at some differences um, between the physics option and chemis option. In fact, this table explains those differences. Physics option generally the forces of attraction are based on Van der Waals forces. Chemis option you have chemical bonds or chemical interactions taking place. So, these forces are weak, these forces are 
strong. That is why the enthalpy of uh, the adsorption process also differs dramatically if it is a physics option or a chemist option. In the case of physics option, the enthalpy is of the order of 20 to 40 kilo joule per mole, whereas uh, in the chemist option it is 200 to 400 kilo joule per mole. Physics option generally is observed at low temperature that means below the boiling point of the solute um, and uh, it starts going down with the increasing temperature. That means, the adsorbed physics option process goes down with increasing temperature. Now, chemist option if we take it takes place at high temperature that means, the solute can be in the vapor form and the chemist option takes place effectively. Physics option is not very specific whereas, chemist option is highly specific. So, I am I can just remove one single um, gas from a mixture of gases that is the main adsorption of uh, uh, chemist option process. If you take physics option generally you can have multi layer of the um, adsorbate on the surface of the adsorbent whereas, in chemist option generally it is a monomolecular layer. Physics option is reversible chemist option is irreversible. So, these are the differences between physics option and chemist option. So, um, you can have the same um, solute or same uh, adsorbate uh, adsorbing on the surface of an adsorbent either as a physics option based process uh, or as a chemist option based process. So, if you look at the adsorption kinetics it will look almost like a normal chemical kinetics you have the rate of adsorption on the left hand side and there is a constant here that is called a rate constant. Just like chemical reaction we have a chemical rate constant here also you have a rate constant. Then we have P, P is the partial pressure of the solute which is getting adsorbed and X that is the exponent or kinetic order see it is exactly like your chemical reaction. Okay. So, the rate of adsorption of a molecule on a surface is directly proportional to the pressure raised to the power some exponent value there. Now, we can bring in the Arrhenius term exactly like chemical uh, kinetics we can bring in the Arrhenius term we can bring in the pre exponential term as well or the frequency factor term. So, if you bring in that we have the constant being replaced by A into exponent minus E A by R T multiplied by pressure raised to the power x. So, E is the activation energy for the adsorption process um, R is your universal gas constant and T is the temperature, temperature in Kelvin and A is your pre exponential factor or pre frequency factor or collision factor. So, there are different names for A. So, the rate of adsorption is given by this particular term. So, it looks exactly like your chemical kinetics and the rate of adsorption is governed by mainly two factors the rate of arrival of molecule to the surface. So, you have molecules in the bulk and then you have the surface like a metallic surface or a oxide surface. So, the rate of at which these solutes or adsorbates arrive at the surface of the adsorbent that is one term and then the proportion of incident molecules which undergo adsorption. So, just because they come near the surface or they hit the surface does not mean they get adsorbed, but uh, there is always some proportion of, out of which uh, the bulk of the molecule which come to the surface will get adsorbed. So, these there are two terms. So, there is something called the sticking probability that will come into the picture. So, the rate of adsorption per unit area of the surface because adsorption is always per area is a product of incident molecule that is the flux and the sticking probability that means a molecule just because it hits the surface does not get stuck to the surface. So, there is always a probability. So, the sticking probability in just like any probability term it will vary between 0 and 1. So, the rate term we have it as number of molecules per meter square that is the surface and because it is a rate, rate term we have per second or per time something will come there actually. So, rate of adsorption is equal to the sticking probability into the flux. Now, if you have the flux of incident molecules is given by the Hertz Knudsen equation 
So, the flux F is equal to P is your gas pressure divided by 2 pi m k t raised to the power half. T is your temperature in Kelvin, m is the mass of one molecule, k is your Boltzmann constant. So, this is the flux which can be substituted in this rate of adsorption equation. So, as I said the sticking probability because it is called a probability it will always vary between 0 to 1. So, the lower limit will be 0 that means nothing will get stuck and it can have the highest number as 1 that means whatever comes and hits the surface of the adsorbent will get stuck. So, you can have either 0 or you can have 1 and uh, it depends on the existing coverage of the adsorbed species theta and presence of any activation barrier to adsorption because uh, there is always certain barrier the molecule has to overcome before it can get stuck to the surface. So, there could be an activation barrier. So, we can have a relationship like this sticking probability is equal to f of theta multipli multiplied by exponent minus E a by R t. E a is your activation energy for the adsorption process that is the activation barrier which I talked about before and f theta is a function of the existing surface coverage. So, the sticking probability depends on the amount of surface coverage and presence of any activation barrier. So, you have two terms one is the um, function of the existing surface coverage that is represented in the first term and this is the activation barrier which the molecule has to overcome. So, that it can get adsorbed from a free state. So, the rate of adsorption if you put in all these term here you will end up with rate is equal to f theta into pressure exponent minus E a by R t divided by square root of 2 pi m k t. So, you see uh, the rate of adsorption can be defined in terms of certain fundamental parameters E a, E a is your uh, activation barrier which the molecule has to overcome number 1 t that is the temperature at which you are performing p is the pressure of adsorption and f theta is the existing surface coverage. So, as the surface coverage increases the rate of adsorption will go down as the surface coverage is very very low the rate of adsorption will be very very high. So, you see this um, equation for adsorption can be derived based on the Knudsen equation. Physical adsorption as I said will be decreasing as you increase the temperature because it is a very weak forces and it is physics option and it is generally happening below the boiling point of the solute. So, x by m where x is the amount uh, of adsorbate or solute which gets captured by the adsorbent divided by m is the amount of adsorbent. So, it goes down like that. So, if it is a chemical adsorption initially it will go up and then later it will fall down. So, initially as you increase temperature the amount adsorbed goes up whereas, later on as you keep uh, increasing temperature the amount adsorbed goes down. Now, I introduced three types of uh, adsorption isotherm before let us spend more time on that we will look at those equations and see what is happening. The three types of adsorption is linear, Freundlich and Langmuir. So, linear as the name implies is a linear relationship between the solute adsorbed and the concentration of the solute in the bulk phase. Okay. So, Q is equal to K into X q is the amount of solute adsorbed, adsorbed per amount of adsorbent okay. x is the concentration of the solute in the bulk phase. So, there is an equilibrium that is taking place between the x that is the concentration of solute in the bulk and the concentration of the solute in the adsorbed phase and k is the equilibrium constant. So, this is called a linear relationship understand. So, 
according to this linear relationship as the x increases q will keep on increasing. So, if you look at the x axis here the solute concentration in the solution and this is the amount of solute adsorbed per amount of adsorbent it will keep on increasing in a linear fashion and it will pass through the origin. So, that is called a linear relationship generally um, it will not keep on increasing infinitely because after some time the surface has to have some sort of a surface uh, coverage and uh, it will prevent further adsorption. But uh, at uh, up to certain concentrations of solute in the solution you will find a linear relationship and it becomes easy for you to do perform certain calculations if you assume a linear relationship between q and x. So, here q is the solute concentration um, adsorbed on the adsorbent and x is the solute concentration in the solution. So, there is a equilibrium between the solute in the adsorbed phase and in the bulk phase and k is that equilibrium constant. Now, let us look at another adsorption isotherm that is called the Freundlich which is given by curve like this. So, here q equal to k x raised to the power n again you have a k which is the equilibrium constant, but here the difference is you have a term called n n can be greater than 1 or it can be less than 1. So, if n is uh, less than 1 we can say adsorption is favorable if it is uh, greater than 1 then we can say adsorption is not favorable. So, the graph also will be like this or it may be in a different form actually depending upon the value of n. So, here I have drawn a graph for n is smaller values. So, the Freudlich isotherm gives a non-linearity to the adsorption isotherm, where the adsorption isotherm relates the solute concentration in the adsorbent phase and in the bulk phase. Q is what the solute concentration in the adsorbed phase and X is the solute concentration in the bulk phase or the solution phase. Now, let us look at the third adsorption isotherm that is given by the Langmuir adsorption isotherm. So, what happens here the solute concentration in the adsorbed phase increases as I increase the solute concentration in the solution and after that it saturates it plateaus it remains constant. That means, the number of sites available for adsorption of the adsorbate in the adsorbent reaches a saturation there are no more sites available. So, even if you increase the concentration of the solute in the solution it will not get adsorbed that is why it will sort of flatten out. So, initially it looks like a linear relation and after that it flattens out you see that. So, initially it is a linear and then after that further increase in solute concentration in the solution will not have any um, effect on the concentration of the solute found on the adsorbent and this equation is given like this q equal to q naught into x divided by some constant k plus x. So, if you look at this equation at very very small x values this denominator we can neglect this x. So, you will have x only in the numerator. So, it will look like a linear relationship between q and x. So, at very low x values it is like a linear relation q is directly proportional to x at very low x values. Okay. At very high x values if we neglect k that this x and x this x will cancel. So, you will end up with the constant that means, at very large x values q will not depend on x. So, it is like a 0 order reaction that means, very large x values your q will be constant it is a 0 order reaction. So, at very low x values when the x is very very small you will have q directly proportional to this x. So, q and x are related as a first order relationship here and at very large x values these x's will cancel. So, q will be a 0 order relationship with respect to x that means, uh, increase in x will have no effect on q 
So, this represents a first order relationship between q and x and this represents a zero order relationship with respect to q and x. This happens at very large values of x because your surface is getting saturated. There are no more vacant sites available for the um, adsorbate to come and uh, adsorb on the surface of the adsorbent. And this type of relationship is mostly more realistic when compared to your uh, linear or uh, Freudlich. And generally these relationships are reasonable at very low concentrations of x. But at very large concentrations of x, I think uh, I would say uh, you can assume the relationship between q and x to follow a some sort of a Langmuir isotherm. But uh, the most important assumption you need to remember in Langmuir is that it is a monolayer adsorption. That means, once the site is occupied by one adsorbate, you cannot have another adsorbate sticking, sticking on top of it. So, it is a monolayer adsorption process. So, that is the main assumption in the Langmuir adsorption isotherm derivation. Now, let us look at the different types of uh, adsorption process, how a chemical engineer will look at, because a chemical engineer is used to process type of approach and um, you will look at different types of process. You can have batch adsorption, you can have a continuous adsorption and so on. What happens in a batch adsorption? What do you do? You take a adsorbent and then you add it to a solution containing the adsorbate or the solute which you need to adsorb, mix them both thoroughly and then uh, let them reach an equilibrium. You filter out the adsorbent and hopefully the solute would have got adsorbed in the adsorbent. The, so, the solute could be a toxic waste, unwanted chemical um, and so on or it could be a protein of your interest or a metabolite of your interest. So, in a batch process what you do is you mix the adsorbent and the, the bulk solution which contains your adsorbate, mix it up thoroughly then filter it. And then you may have to re regenerate uh, your adsorbent, so that it can be again reused. That means, how do you regenerate? If it is a gaseous type of reaction, you can heat it up. So, hopefully the adsorbate will get uh, desorbed and the surface is available or you can use uh, an activating agent. Sometimes you may use a uh, um, concentrated hydrochloric acid or you may use oxygen gas at high temperature. For example, if you are using oxygen gas at high temperature, it will burn away um, the chemicals or waste material that has adsorbed on the surface into CO2. That way your surface will be again available for further adsorption or you can reduce the pressure, pressure so that whatever has been adsorbed can get desorbed. So, this are the activation. So, in a batch process you have two sets of operation, one is the adsorption operation, other is the uh, desorption operation where you are regenerating your adsorbent. And now, the adsorbent is available for um, further adsorption. So, when you mix the uh, adsorbent into the bulk, your solute gets partitioned um, between the, adsorb, um, the adsorbent or in the bulk, okay. that is your K the constant value which com comes into picture actually. So, this process is a bit slow, it is a time consuming because you need to do the adsorption and then you need to do the desorption or regeneration, again you, you go back to the first step. So, um, it is a slow process and time consuming, batch process is always slow and time consuming, actually. but it is very easy um, because uh, uh, you just need a vessel, uh, you take your solution which contains your solid that needs to be adsorbed you add your adsorbent, mix it and then uh, you take it to another filter or another vessel where you are uh, separating it out. Then you can take it to a third vessel where you are regenerating your adsorbent and again bring it back to the first vessel. So, that is how you keep doing this operation. It is a manual operation because you need to um, mix them, remove them, filter them, regenerate, again mix them and so on. Let us look at the mass balance in a batch adsorption process. Suppose, if I want to design a adsorption system 
I need to know how much adsorbent I need to take to remove certain percentage of a toxic uh, metabolite or a solute. Okay. So, I need to decide on that or if I know um, I am going to add certain amount of adsorbent, how much of this uh, solute will get removed. So, if I want to do both these type of calculations, all I need to do is, is a mass balance. The, the concept, the principle is very, very simple. You just do a mass balance for the solute, that is all. So, here we have a stage, you are adding a feed solution which contains excess concentration of the solute that needs to be adsorbed. Okay. Then you are adding the adsorbent that is the solid. So, imagine your F is a liquid and W is a solid. The solid may contain certain concentration of uh, adsorbate. If you are adding a fresh adsorbent, then of course, Q F will be 0, but if you are using an old adsorbent, it may contain uh, some of the adsorbate present here. So, there are two inputs and there are two outputs. The one output is your bulk solution F. So, the same con amount of F that is entering is leaving, but the concentration of the solute or the adsorbate here would have decreased because some of the adsorbate has been adsorbed. So, if you look at the W that is your adsorbent, the amount will be the same W here and W there but uh, it would have picked up some solute. So, here q will be greater than q f whereas, here x will be less than x f because some of the solute or the adsorbate has been transferred to the adsorbent. So, there are two inputs two outputs. So, what do we do? We take a concentration of solute in here con plus concentration of solute in here that should be equal to concentration of solute out in this stream plus concentration of solute out in this stream. So, there are two inputs, two outputs and this is what this equation represents. X f into f is the amount of solute coming in through this stream, Q f into w is the amount of solute coming in in this stream. This should be equal to x into f that is the amount of solute leaving in this stream and Q into w that is the amount of solute leaving in this stream. This stream is because of the adsorbent and this stream these two streams are because of the solution or the bulk liquid which contains your adsorbate. So, the bulk liquid is losing some adsorbate which is taken up by the adsorbent that is what this equation is. So, here x f is your concentration of your solute in the feed Q f is the concentration of the solute in the adsorbent, x is the concentration of the solute that is leaving the feed and Q is the concentration of the solute in the adsorbent that is leaving the stage. So, this is a single stage mass balance. So, knowing certain terms we can calculate the unknowns. So, f is the quantity or the amount of the feed solution it could be in liters per minute or meter cube per minute okay, or cc per minute and w is the weight of the adsorbent that is getting added. It could be in grams, kilograms, micrograms. So, you can see. So, the units please note the units of x and q should be corresponding to that. So, if you have f in liters, so x will have micrograms or grams or kilograms per liter. So, if W is in kg or grams, then your Q will be some concentration per gram or kg. So, that they all match, the units have to match because F is in volume, you will have X will have a denominator volume term and if W is in weight, Q will have a denominator in weight term. So, we can rearrange this equation mass balance equation to get q equal to q f plus f divided by w multiplied by x f minus x. So, x f is the concentration of the solute in the feed solution, x is the concentration of the solute that is leaving uh, in this solution of flow rate f and w is your amount of uh, adsorbent added, 
q of is the initial amount of uh, uh, solute present in your uh, adsorbent and q is the amount of solute that is present in the adsorbent that is leaving the stage. Generally q f is 0, if I am taking a fresh adsorbent there would not be any solute present. So, I can neglect this term q of term and uh, q will be equal to f by w into x f minus x. Okay. This is called the operating line, because if I plot a graph where x axis is x, x is the solute concentration in solution and y axis is q, q is the uh, concentration of the adsorbate in the adsorbent. There will be this will be a straight line this equation okay, and this is called the operating line. So, if you take a continuous stir tank, so far we looked at uh, the batch process. So, in the batch process what we are trying to tell is in a batch process um, you have two streams entering a stage. Okay. One of the stream contains your uh, the bulk solution where the solute is present or the adsorbate is present. Then you have another stream where you have the um, adsorbent which may or may not contain the solute. Um, when you bring both of them together, mix them thoroughly, let them re allow it to reach the equilibrium and separate them using a filter. We are using a filter because we assume the adsorbent is a solid like an activated charcoal or it could be a zeolite or it could be a silica gel, it could be a silica alumina and so on. So, by separating it out you the solute has transferred from the bulk solution into the adsorbent. So, we do a mass balance of uh, the solute present in four streams. What are the four streams? The stream 1 is the feed uh, solution, stream 2 is the fresh or used adsorbent that is added, stream 3 is the um, bulk solution that is leaving. So, it has lost some adsorbate to the adsorbent and stream 4 is the adsorbent that is collected after filtration. Okay. So, some of the adsorbate has moved or got transferred from the bulk solution to the adsorbent. So, that is how a batch process work. So, what I can do? Suppose, if my adsorption efficiency is not 100 percent. Um, I, have, I have achieved about say 60 or 70 percent. Now, I take this solution, take it to another vessel where again I add some adsorbent, again I do a, a adsorption process and again I remove some of the solute. So, I may have multi stage adsorption taking place may be 1, 2, 3 stages. So, I will do in the adsorption where I add the solid, then I will do a filtration and um, then again I will do an adsorption process where I may add some more solid and again I may do a filtration. So, you may have more than one stage that is possible actually. So, that you remove as much of the solute or the adsorbate possible from the bulk solution and uh, especially if you are interested if it could if it is in an environmental type of uh, uh, situation where you do not want that toxin present at all in your uh, water leaving then you do this operation many times until the concentration of the toxin comes down to PB, PPB or even very very small or negligible. Or if there is a situation where you would like to recover a protein of interest, so you do not want any of the protein to go away with the bulk solution, you may, cal you may carry out this adsorption stage 2, stage 3 and many stages until whatever protein is present in your bulk solution has been totally adsorbed. So, that is how you do in a batch process. Now, let us look at a continuous process where as the name implies the adsorption process is continuous. So, in a continuous process what can happen? You may add your feed solution or the bulk solution continuously. This feed solution may contain 
your uh, solute or adsorbate at a concentration of xf. Now, you have a tank containing your solid which is the adsorbent like it may have the activated carbon inside or the zeolite inside. So, the solution comes in they get mixed thoroughly here because there is a residence time here the solute gets adsorbed in the by the adsorbent. So, the solution that is leaving will have a concentration of the solute x here x will be less than x f. So, during that residence inside the solute gets transferred from the bulk phase to the solid phase. So, there is always a residence time in this process and the what is the residence time we can calculate the residence time um, if I know the volume of the um, tank and also the feed solution. So, if I do V divided by F that gives you the residence time of the solution inside the vessel adsorber as you call it adsorber. The most important thing is uh, the solution that is leaving the tank should not carry the adsorbent as well. So, generally you will have a filter unit present here, so that the solids are retained and kept inside your vessel and they do not get transferred and travel with the liquid that is leaving the tank. So, this is how a continuous stirred tank adsorber works. So, you can adjust your residence time and um, so that the adsorption um, is efficient or there is a equilibrium that will be reached between the, uh, the solution that is uh, leaving the vessel with the solids that are present inside the vessel. So, what are the advantages disadvantages with a continuous adsorber? You can continuously process uh, some fluid that is one advantage, but one disadvantage as we keep on mixing the solids may start breaking down into smaller particles and they may start traveling and leaving the adsorber with the um, effluent stream or the exit stream. So, that could be a disadvantage in that you assume that the, uh, the liquid that is entering uh, reaches an equilibrium with the solids that are present inside. So, your residence time has to be sufficient so that they reach an equilibrium. So, you need to keep those that also in mind actually. So, let we can also do a mass balance for the continuous turn tank adsorber as well. So, what are the things happening in a continuous stirred tank adsorber? There is a feed entering that is the bulk solution that is entering which contains your solute x f is the concentration of the solute in the feed, x is the concentration of the solute leaving. So, f x f minus x is the concentration difference which has been taken up. Okay. Now, this minus 1 minus epsilon v are adsorbed, this is the amount of solute that gets transferred to the adsorbent where here epsilon is the void age. Okay. So, V is the volume of the vessel, R is the rate of adsorption process. So, this is the mass balance on the right hand side. Now, this should be equal to the accumulation. So, here we are talking about input minus output minus amount getting adsorbed from the liquid phase into the solid phase. Okay. So, this is the input minus output leaving the vessel that is material coming into the vessel, material leaving the vessel minus the material that is getting transferred from the liquid phase to the solid phase. This should be equal to the amount that is getting accumulated inside the vessel. So, what is accumulated inside the vessel? So, epsilon into V this is the amount of the liquid present inside the vessel multiplied by dx by dt, where x is the concentration of the solute in the bulk inside the vessel. So, this is the amount accumulation E into V dx by dt. This is the amount of the solute entering the vessel because of the flow of the 
fluid and this is the amount that is leaving the vessel because of the flow of the liquid flowing out and this is the amount that is getting adsorbed from the solution phase or the bulk phase to the adsorbent phase. Okay. So, epsilon is the void age. So, E epsilon into V gives you the amount of liquid present inside the reactor or the adsorber 1 minus epsilon into V tells you the amount of the liquid that is epsilon V 1 minus E into V gives you the amount of uh, solids present in the vessel. So, epsilon into V tells you the amount of uh, liquid present inside the vessel 1 minus epsilon into V tells you the amount of solids present in the vessel. So, this is called the mass balance entire mass balance and uh, if you want to solve this particular equation we need to have some initial condition right. So, so initially the vessel will not have any solute present inside at time equal to 0 your solute with the solution starts flowing inside. So, whatever adsorbed initially at time equal to 0 will be 0 and then slowly there will be a build up of solute inside the vessel as well as in the exit stream. So, you can solve this first order differential equation and by doing that we will be able to calculate uh, what is the effect of uh, uh, time on the concentration that is x um, that is the concentration of the solute that is leaving the vessel. So, in order to do that we need to still consider many other terms for example, um, we need to have an equation for the R adsorbed okay. we need to have an equation for the R adsorbed. So, we can assume a mass transfer type of relationship all chemical engineers will know what is mass transfer. So, it is a very common term because you are going to have um, the solute present in the liquid phase moving into the uh, solid phase. So, we can have a term like this where R adsorbed is equal to K L into A into x minus x star. Okay. So, K L is the mass transfer coefficient, A is the surface area of adsorbent per tank volume x minus x star where x star is the concentration in the solution which should be in equilibrium with the adsorbent. Okay. This is the driving force and this is the area and this is some constant. So, this three terms together gives you the rate of adsorption and uh, if it is a linear adsorption isotherm like as we saw before q can be is equal to k into x star. So, we can instead of x star put it as q by k here. So, here instead of R adsorption we can uh, write this particular equation and instead of x star we can write it as q by k. So, once you have these terms included into our first order differential equation it becomes very simple for one to solve let us not go into the solution of this first order differential equation, but if you solve this first order differential equation you will end up with the uh, equation of this form q by k x f is equal to 1 minus there is a e raised to the power minus sigma 1 t there is a e raised to the power minus sigma 2 t. So, e power minus t will always have an exponential type of uh, uh, decaying function where uh, sigma 1 and sigma 2 is given by this particular uh, equation and uh, b that is present inside this equation is given by this. So, you can see uh, yeah, quite a simple relationship which connects uh, the q that is the amount of uh, solute that gets adsorbed onto the surface as a function of time okay, with all the basic parameters like flow rates, the volume of the tank. Uh, the the void age factor the k which is the um, partition between the liquid and the solid phase k l is the mass transfer coefficient 
small a is the interfacial area and so on actually. So, you have all the basic uh, um, design terms relating between a t the time and the q. So, how will the relationship will look like? So, as the time increases initially q will go up because initially you have fresh uh, adsorb adsorbent present inside your tank. So, as time increases um, the value for q will start from 0 and then uh, go up and uh, get saturated. So, after that you will not be able to allow the same adsorbent to um, adsorb any more fresh solute or adsorbate. So, what do you have to do? We, we need to stop the um, process and uh, regenerate your adsorbent or we need to add fresh adsorbent and so on actually. So, again as time increases the x of minus x initially at time equal to 0 it will be here and then it will start going down and um, it will reach a plateau here. Actually. So, after some time your adsorbent gets fully saturated with the adsorbate. So, as I said uh, we need to do some sort of a regeneration of the uh, adsorbent or we need to add fresh adsorbent. So, these are the two different ways by which you can um, increase the um, adsorption of the solute. So, we looked at two different types of uh, operating conditions one is the batch type of adsorption other one is the continuous type of uh, adsorption. In the batch type what do you do? We take uh, the um, adsorbent that is the fresh adsorbent or used adsorbent that is a solid then mix it up thoroughly with your uh, um, bulk solution which contains your adsorbate and then you filter it. So, by doing this you have transferred some of the solute or adsorbate present in the bulk to the adsorbent. So, once you have transferred you can desorb and again regenerate your adsorbent and again put it back uh, for further recycle. Whereas, in a continuous process what do you do? you have a stirred vessel, you have the adsorbent present all the time inside the liquid flows in and uh, the solute that is present or the adsorbate that is present gets adsorbed. So, when the liquid goes out um, the concentration of the solute going out will be much less than the concentration of the solute that is inside the vessel. Okay. So, how did we model it? Here we have something like a different yes, first order differential equation. Um, so, input minus output minus the amount adsorbed will be equal to the accumulation. So, this is a very standard mass balance relationship. So, by taking that um, by assuming that the rate of adsorption follows a mass transfer type of process and if you assume a linear relationship we can have a numeric we can have an analytical solution for the adsorption process as a function of time. But if you have a non-linear relationship uh, for the adsorption isotherm like a um, Langmuir type of model, then um, you will not be able to get a simple um, analytical solution, but you need to use some sort of a numerical package to solve this uh, uh, entire differential equation, because it becomes slightly a non-linear type of differential equation rather than a linear type of differential equation, but it can be solved using a um, MATLAB or any other uh, differential equation solver type of uh, package. So, we can get a relationship between the um, rate of adsorption process depending upon the flow rate into the stirred tank as well as the volume of the stirred tank. So, we can manipulate and we can change the adsorption process.